Well, it gives me a very, very warm, fuzzy feeling, okay, to bring to the podium here two very, very special people. And first one up is going to be my adopted granddaughter, okay, Joanna Beltran. And it is such, such an honor, such a privilege to be able to hear what the Lord speaks through our young people. This is the legacy. This is what is bringing up the movement coming forward here. So I just want us all to, before Joanna comes up, and she'll be followed by Chad Campmeyer, I would just like for us all to just take a, a moment here to pray. Can we do that? Father in heaven, I am so grateful for this time of gathering. I thank you that we can gather, that we are able to assemble ourselves together to hear your word. I pray, Lord, the eyes of our understanding, the ears, our spiritual ears, would be opened in a new anointed way this morning to hear your word like we have never heard before. Open it up today so that we are enabled and equipped even more to be effective disciples in this earth during this harvest during this time, and I pray for a, a peace that will come upon our speakers, Lord, that you have directed to hear your word from. I pray that there is a peace right now that comes upon them, a peace of confidence, power, strength, and anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody can say... Amen. Miss Joanna. Yeah, give her a hand. Come on. Hello, how are you? <laughs> oh, wow. Worship was <laughs> so good. I'm so blessed. I told Jenny um, that, well, she didn't schedule me to sing today but I asked her are you do you need any players because I won't be able to sit in that chair if I see all of my people in the stage I won't be able to contain myself but um I I was just like meditating when I was in the stage I was like I was just like looking at, around me and seeing all of you and seeing the worshipers and in in the presence of the Lord so strong and I was like I was like God, what it is? What is it that that you? What what it is that I can leave this place, walking out this building, and know that I was fulfilled and filled up with the Spirit and like satisfied in every single area of my life? What is it, God? And and He told me, well, first of all, you're worshiping with all your soul. You're worshiping with all your heart, and number like well it's not a feeling it's not a feeling it's it's it's, it's what we're doing it's what we're meant to do to be doing like danny said we like the angels are singing in heaven we're gonna do this forever and then also we are in the body we are uniting with everybody else as the body and so when we come with each other we become complete we become and we form and, and we and we are able to release those gifts and to release those um spiritual gifts that the Lord has given us to to complete the body of Christ. And so Mark told us on Thursday, last Thursday, to to share about the secret place. And Chad and I had just been feeling so strong that we had to share this with the youth. Because we can give the gospel, we can share the gospel, we can share about the Lord, and, we're, and we keep repeating, 
intimacy with the Lord or, or the secret place or go into your quiet place. But like so many people don't know what that is. So many people do not know how to experience that, how to get there. Like, what is it? What's the secret place? What is, what is going into your room and like quiet yourself down? Like, I've never done that before. And also that, that, can, that, can, that can be connected to not even be able to hear the Lord clearly because you're not having that quiet time. And so we said that we could just share that. And, and I was thinking, well, my approach to the youth is way different to my approach to my church because the youth is one crowd and one, like, um, how do you explain, um, like a single ear and the church is a complete different thing. Because you are older, well, some of you are younger than me, of course, but you are, have way more experience than me. You have way more wisdom than I do and have probably experienced more things with the Lord than I have experienced. So I was like, what can I offer and what can I share that will be something that will, that will truly penetrate their hearts and become like an appetizer so that they can even seek stronger the presence of the Lord. And Chad and I were thinking how we're not going to, we can't, re, we can't present the gospel to people. We can present the gospel, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, who he is. But we can't give them the secret place. We can't give them the secrets and mysteries of the Lord. We can't give them prophecy. We can't give them anything, not even to you. We can't give them what the Lord has secretly planned for you and only you to hear. And so what all I can do is just bring an appetizer and bring something that will stir up your heart to seek him even stronger and more passionately than than, than how you were today or yesterday. So I remember hearing this man saying that we have to become professionals of seeking the Lord's presence. And we ha- that has to be like, like our, like our, like our um, how do you explain it? Um, like our work. Like let's become completely equipped well equipment actually is the outcome but let's become professional and become in relationship with the lord's presence and i thought about the word intimacy and i remember dave one time he he preached about intimacy and the word intimacy and how we box this word and in, in so many, and we put labels on intimacy with the Lord. And, and I was like, okay, what, does inti- what is intimacy like? What does intimacy mean just in general? And there are so many definitions in the, in the um, dictionary about intimacy. And you can have your own representation and your own um, uh, description of the intimacy, how intimacy looks like. But intimacy in the dictionary, it means, let me go back to my notes. Intimacy means close familiarity or friendship or closeness. Just like close familiarity. But spiritual intimacy, I was defining it, or I heard one time, as the close relationship with the presence of the Lord. A close, you're familiar and you're in relationship with the presence of the Lord. That means that you are having a one-on-one conversation with the Lord, and it's only you and Him. And I thought, well, how can we take this into an even higher or deeper level? And the Lord told me that we have to be experts in diving into His presence. Experts. And what do, and, and I can give you this step one, two, three, but... but it's a daily practice. And I'm going to share a dream that I had. I think a couple of people here have already heard this dream. Um, but I was sharing the other day um, about a dream that I had. I didn't even really know what it meant. Uh, I had zero idea. And I was, and you probably will hear it and be like, oh, 
that's obvious, Joe. How did you not think about this? And I was like, and I would be like, no, like I, I didn't even find an explanation for it. But anyways, the dream, this dream, um, in this like dark cave, um, an enclosed like cave with, there was a, like a spring flowing, um, very blue water and clear water. It was very, but it was a dark cave, but somehow the light was like shining on the water so I could see it. And inside this cave, there was like a cliff, like a really, really tall rock. And I was jumping off from that rock and I was diving into the clear water and I was jumping off and diving and diving and diving and diving. And I remember for a long time in my dream, I, had, I was just falling into the water, like, you know, like a repetitive, like scene of me just diving into a into clear water. And um, I wasn't scared of the cave. I wasn't scared of hitting rocks. I wasn't scared of the darkness. I wasn't scared of anything. I was just like... I was just like, this is what I got to do. I just got to practice diving into this water. And I was like this like professional driver, not driver, diver. Um, and I remember just being so committed to diving, so committed. And I don't re even remember in my dream, like climbing up the rock to, to fall into the water. Like, I just remember just the fact that I was diving into it. And after that, after, after a while of just diving, I... I'm like, okay, I'm done. And then I go into this door connected to the cave, which caves don't have doors, but I was walking into this door and I was like, okay, I'm going to leave. And so it's like, I open the door and it's like the cave is just like a room and I'm entering this like place, a big dining area with all of you sitting in tables and families and, and just talking and dining with each other and, and, and just having fellowship. And, and I go around these tables and I'm talking like, hi, how are you? And just like praying for each other, doing all these things. But I'm never sitting in a table. I'm just always working and I'm, I'm in this like mission. And I remember just just being done with that. Just feeling that I'm done with, with, with just being with everybody and just go, going like, okay, I need to go back to the cave. I need to go back to diving. I need to go back to practice. I'm so committed to this. And I desire this even way more than spending all this time out, out here. Like this is, that, that's my desire. This is just my outcome. And I mean, you, you probably know what it, what it means, but if you don't have an idea of what this means, I think just that the being in that cave and diving into that water was walking and diving into this the presence of the lord just practice and practice and practice seeking his presence wanting and longing just to be with him and it's this daily daily and even more than twice a day like just a daily diving into his presence and after after i was fulfilled and like ready and felt okay i practice enough i can go out and serve in my local church, or I can go out and serve here. I can go out and, and probably have a good attitude in my work day or have a good attitude in my house or have, ha or be able to, to minister onto any of you or be able to, to, to help someone in need. But if I'm not having that intimate fellowship with the Lord and that professional diving and diving, not even professional, because I was like just practicing. So I won't be able to release anything. Because it can't come from me. Nothing that you do here can come from your own strength. The Bible says that by ourselves we're nothing. If I don't have love, I have nothing. And God is love. So if we don't have love, if we don't have God, we are nothing. And, and I thought about the word equipment. And equipment, how are we equipped to do the works? How are we equipped to serve, how are we equipped to perform, I mean, not to perform, sorry, to use those gifts that the Lord has given us? How will you even figure out what gifts you have if you don't spend that time with the Lord? How did I know I had to go out and serve because I was in that cave? I just knew I had to. And maybe outside, I'm not diving. I'm not doing the same thing as I'm doing in the cave. In the cave, I'm doing a totally different thing. It looks completely different and mysterious and dark and, like, amazing, like this water. But when I come out, I'm, be, I'm, I'm not doing my own work. I'm doing the Lord's work. And I want you to look for Ephesians 4, 11.
Ephesians 4.11. And I'm going to read from verse 11 till verse 16. And so it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach, reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to read verse 11 again. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then I'm going to read verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind of, of, by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful sch- scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow and become in every, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And I know this goes a lot with, like, the fact that we're a body and, and, and we're working and, and together and, and, and we're going to grow with each other and we have to practice. But I thought about the word equipment and equipped and I can't give you what your gift is. I can't tell you what it is. But the Lord has a very intentional, intentional um, mysteries, intentional giftings, inten- like not only for this church, but for yourself, like for your own growth, for your own relationship with the Lord. Because what? Because that's what you have to desire the most. You, you and God, nobody else, nobody to tell you what you gotta do, what you know, what you don't have to do, but only you and God. And I want to read Second of Timothy, three seventeen. I'm gonna read it real quick, real quick, from verse sixteen. Second of Timothy three. 16 and 17. It says, All scripture is God breathed and his and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that we so sorry, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so I love it that it's saying all scripture is breathed by God. All all that you read, the bread of life is God it's like is going to be useful for teaching for rebuking for to do the work but you won't be able to know what the word what what is that bread of life what is that bread that daily bread in that teaching until you spend that secret time with the Lord and it can look so many ways it can be in your room it can be in your bed it can be your closet it can be your car i have experienced so many things in my car already like i i just got my car and i'm already like i was really like poured myself out to god like ah, like like god there's so many places we can use and we can we can experience the lord in and we have to become experts and we have to become experts because God wants us to practice and seek him every day. See, we can't live out of yesterday's bread. And I think I've already shared that. I don't know who I've shared that with probably a lot of times. But we can't live out of yesterday's bread. We can't live out of yesterday's word like, oh, the Lord told me this yesterday. I'm going to hold on to this. Like, yeah, I read the, I, I read the word yesterday, so I'm not going to be able to, like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with yesterday. Like, I'm fine, God. I don't need to seek you. Like, I'm fine. No. We need to be very intentional in seeking him for the sake of today. Seeking him because God has something new every day. He says his mercies are new every morning. 
That means he has something new to present to us, some, a new mystery to uncover, a new, a, new, a new revelation in his word, maybe even a new word of prophecy, maybe even a new dream, a new vision, maybe even a new verse you had never even read before. And you're like, wow. And you read something and then, and then you reread it and there's something completely different. Have you seen those images? Like, they're like holograms. I don't know how to describe them, but like when you move, it's like one image when you're standing in front of it and then you like move and it changes completely. Like that's the word. Like that's how I see the word. Like, it, it, like you see the word and you read it and then it means something to you and it speaks to you, but then you see it from a different perspective. It completely reflects something, completely, completely different image, it, but it still goes along. You know, it still goes along with the previous message. It, it never denies itself and never contradicts itself or cancels itself but it completes itself as a complete circle and so um our desire has to be abiding in that presence and i just want to reveal i just want to show you before i end i just want to show you david's heart in second of samuel 7 1 let's go to that it's just one but one little verse but I loved David's heart in this verse. And this is when the ark was, the ark of the covenant and the ark of the Lord, where the Lord's presence abided in, in the times of, of, of David. And then in the um, people of Israel, they, they didn't have a settled place to be. And they were walking around, changing all these towns, and they were carrying the ark of the Lord, and they were carrying the presence of the Lord in one single box. And they were going around and around, and, and, David, and David longed, like he was like, ah, oh. he was like, I need to give, I need to prepare a place for the Lord. I need to build him a temple. I can't stand anymore just walking around carrying this ark, but I need to build him something like like, I desire to abide. He says in Psalms 27 that only one thing I ask, to be in the house of the Lord forever. That's the, that, that was David's desire. to He prioritized the place of intimacy with the Lord. And he even was willing to give everything of, that he had, all his money, all his rich, riches. He, he was willing to spend all that just to build the ark, just to build a temple where the Lord's presence would abide. And we know that the Lord's presence does not abide in a single box or in a building, right? But what was David's heart here? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from um, 2 Samuel 7. It says, after the king was settled in his palace, that means David, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. And so that was David's desire. He was like, I'm here living in this beautiful castle, this beautiful place, and the ark of God is still in a tent, and I haven't built it yet. But the Lord, after, after that, gave him a promise that he, he wouldn't be able to, 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 to um, build a temple, but it was going to be his son. But our desires are what we truly are. Our desires define who we are. And so that means that if David desired to be a relationship seeker and be in relationship with the presence of God, that means that that, means that, that was who he was. That he wasn't faking anything. He wasn't pretending to be anybody else. But he was just desiring that from the bottom of his heart. And Jesus wants us to depend on him to depend fully on him and i'm just going to read one more thing before i close but but i want to read from mark 6 30 and we share that um, thursday with the youth that just impacted me and i was sharing with my mom how how amazing the word is because I had never read this Bible verse ever in my life before. So this was after Jesus uh, Jesus heard and he re received the, the news that 
John the Baptist, his cousin had passed away and they had beheaded him. And so Jesus was probably in a very, um, like just, uh, how do you say it? Uh, like mourning, like he was mourning for, for his, for his cousin, remembering his cousin and probably just being like, wow, like in this, like probably grieving season. Um, and I know Jesus in his life, as you read, he spent time alone with God. He saw that quiet time. There, that's that's where my preaching. You know, well, this message can end. If Jesus did it, then we should do it too. But, but I'm just gonna share. I'm just gonna share um, Mark six thirty, and this is after John the Baptist is beheaded. So the apostles gather around Jesus and reported to him that they had done what they had done and taught. So the disciples were like, hey, like, this is what we've been doing. You sent us one on, uh, two by two. That we've, like, ministered. We've done all these things. We've worked. And verse 31 says, then, because so many people were coming and going, that they, had, that they, that they, they, didn't, that they did not even have a chance to eat. So <laughs> the disciples were doing all these works, and they were, like, probably working a lot. A lot of people coming and going seeking Jesus, and, and, and he was probably healing them. They were probably doing all these works. They didn't even have a chance to eat, so they were probably really hungry. And I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry, I get in a bad mood. <laughs> I, I can't stand it. You know, I, I need to eat, and, and probably the disciples were in a bad mood too, or were really tired. And Jesus, I love it, because he doesn't say, oh, let's go to a restaurant, let's go buy bread. Like, it's been a long day, let's go eat, like, to the market, eat something. No. Jesus said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Instead of feeding their needs, Jesus said, go with me in a quiet place and get some rest. And even that, I think it's like fasting. It's like, probably Jesus was calling them to fast. He was like, get some rest with me. That's the heart of the Lord. That's the heart of Jesus. He goes, don't, he says, don't feed yourselves with food that spoils, but with the bread of life, which is Jesus. And so Jesus desired that quiet time with his disciples. And so, and so if Jesus desires that, that's what we should do. And the fact, just the fact that he desires that for us makes us worthy. Because I used to battle with unworthiness. I used to feel like I wasn't worthy of, of the Lord's presence. I wasn't worthy of even him talking, revealing all these things to me. I, I didn't feel worthy or capable. I just felt like I, I had done so many bad things or whatever. I don't even know. I, but I was just like, I don't feel worthy. I just feel like this like normal person. And, and just the fact that he calls our name, he calls us, that makes us completely, fully worthy of his presence. And yes, um, we shouldn't be ashamed or shameful. We shouldn't prioritize our emotions. We shouldn't prioritize not even what we feel. Because what we feel can go back and forth. What we feel is unstable. Our heart is deceitful. But only the word of God remains forever. So I'm just going to pray before Chad comes. And I'm sorry if I <laughs> talked through a long time. But let's just, um, Jesus, we lift your name up. Jesus, thank you for for this time with you. Thank you for for stirring up our hearts and hunger for you, God. Thank you because you're going to reveal yourself to, to each one of us in your perfect timing, in your perfect intention, and revealing your mysteries to God. I pray for open up eyes. I pray for, for dreams and visions. I pray for, for prophecy, for, for prophetic word, God. I pray for more of you and less of us because as we seek you, we die to ourselves. Lord, that only you would be increased and that we decrease, God. Thank you, Father. We give you all the glory and all praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, chat. All right. I'll try not to take too long. Um, but... I do have some stuff that I, I would love to say, and it's just wonderful how the Lord, he can bring forth just like a great opening seeds in our hearts um, for what he wants to share. 
But I just want to start by saying how, how thankful and blessed I am to just be here with everyone. Like, it just makes me so happy uh, to be with my church family. And it's just so incredible to me because it's just, it's, it's a sacrifice to be here. We take our time, and how, of us, how many of us know that time is the most valuable commodity that we have? You know, money comes and goes, but time, we only have a limited amount on this earth, and it says tomorrow is not promised, so thank you for being here today, and I just thank you guys all for being here, and I thank you for taking your time to listen, and, and um, I'm just so thankful to be up here. Um, but like Joanna mentioned, um, we we really felt in our heart to, to share to the youth about um, the secret place. You know, the Lord was really working on us about, about the secret place, about taking time and understanding what that time looks like and understanding what the secret place is. So Mark told us, he, he heard the, the message we presented to the youth and he, and he told us to come bring it to you guys and you know, I prayed about it to the Lord, and He kind of just expanded it to in my mind and everything. But um, I, I kind of want to start kind of at a familiar place for a lot of us, where we understand what the secret place is, and that's Matthew six um, and verse five. If you guys want to go there with me, that's Matthew six and verse five. And in this, Jesus is talking about um, talking about. The Pharisees and how they pray. You know, the religious rulers at the, of the day, kind of the, they were the people who, before Jesus came, they were kind of the, the, the flagship Christians. You know, they were the, not Christians, but they were at the time that, you know, they were representing the faith. But Jesus says, no, they, they, what they are doing is, is wrong. So he wants to show to them what it is. So in Matthew 6, verse 5, it says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees you in the secret place will reward you openly. And so, right off, Jesus is saying, this model that you have of prayer is wrong. This model that, that prayer is supposed to make you look like a better Christian is wrong. Because if we understand what prayer is, and Jesus then goes into a model prayer, we all know the Lord's Prayer, right? And, and we were talking about that this morning. You know, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So before that, Jesus is saying, your image of prayer is wrong. What needs to be prayer is just between you and him. Because prayer is a communication with the Father. Prayer is a two-way street. You know, it's us communicating to Him, but it's allowing Him to communicate with us. And if we're so busy and we're focused on, just, it's just for other people to, to think we're holy. Well, Jesus says they got the reward. That They prayed on the corner of the street so that they could be praised by man. And He said they have the reward. But He says when you pray in secret place, where the door is shut and it's only for the Lord, then your reward is his presence. Your reward is that he will bless you openly. But I want to explain how he blesses op us openly because when I first read this, um, my first understanding was, oh, he'll bless me openly. So I need to go in the secret place so that I can be a better speaker, so that I can be a better Christian, so that I can be more fruitful in my life. But when we understand what he means by that, we understand it's not, we don't go to the secret place to reap benefits. We go to the secret place to desire him. And then without striving, fruit comes. So I want to read Psalm 91. Um, and a lot of us are familiar with this as well. But this, that verse really speaks about the power that comes from the secret place. What, what benefits do we get from being in his presence drawing close to him when it's just us and him, nothing around us. And so Psalm 91 says, 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In just that first verse, we see that those who, who abide in the secret place, they rest under the shadow of the Almighty. So when we realize, when we, when we go into a place where it's just for him, prayer just for him, we begin to realize how close the Father is. When we understand that God doesn't draw farther away from us and, and neither does he draw close to us because when we have been born again, 
He came and he put a spirit in us that he was close to us, he's near to us. And, but what this says is that when we abide in the secret place, we shall be in the, in the shadow of the Almighty. We realize how close he is to us and we realize that when we spend that time to him, we're focusing our eyes on him. And we're focusing our eyes on how great he is, how magnificent he is. We realize that he is not some small God, but we realize that he is a big God who's protecting us, but it's only when we draw close to him in our heart and in our mind and we encounter him in the secret place only for him. Well, if you continue reading in in Psalm 91, it says, And I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, and he shall cover you with his feathers, and and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid the terror of the terror by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor by the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor by the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look, and you shall see the reward of the wicked. So what I see from this verse is that when we draw close to the Lord in the secret place, not only do we realize how great the Father is and how close He is and how powerful and wonderful He is, but we also get to see that His Word says that He protects us. We realize how great He is. We realize that, like Joanna was saying, that He's he's God, and and when we rely on Him, when we realize that we make it a, a, a discipline to spend time with Him, we realize that He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That it doesn't matter if there's threats in the daytime, the noontime, or at night. He is our protector. It doesn't matter if, if there's arrows flying at us or if it's spears or if it's a sword coming up against us. We are protected by his greatness. We are protected by his mighty hand. And he, he gives us the image, David gives us the image of being under the, 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 his wings, right? Like a bird that covers their, their, their chicks under the wings. He protects the ones that he loves. He protects the ones that draw, draw near to him. And he says that a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but but it says that it shall not come near you. And so when we realize how great he is, we realize how powerful he is, then we realize that it doesn't matter what's going on around us, but being in the secret place, we realize that our, our, the outside situation does not affect who God is. With the things that are happening in this world, and we see a lot of crazy things happen in this world, but it doesn't affect how God is. It doesn't affect that he's the protector. It doesn't affect that he's great and mighty. And that is who our God is, and this is, this is the effect of drawing close to him in the secret place. And so I want to read an important thing um, that also comes from the secret place, because this protection and realizing the protection of the Holy Spirit that's in us and, and his power and his mighty hand in our life, that is a benefit of the secret place. But being in the secret place is also so important because of how we're filled. So I want to read um, John 10. If you want to go to John 10, and it's in verse, let's see, verse 26. Um, Okay. Verse 26 says, But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. As I have said to you, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And they shall, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than I, and all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I, my Father, are one. So I think this realization that if we are his sheep, we must spend time around the shepherd. Because when dangers come, we need to know his voice. We need to know, is this him speaking, or is it the world speaking? Is this him speaking, or is this my emotions speaking? So he says the ones who, he says, my sheep, they hear my voice and they know it and they follow me. So we want to be his sheep. We want to be the sheep of the good shepherd. We want to follow him, but it takes getting to know his voice. Imagine a little sheep that can't stay by the shepherd, wanders off all the time, and the only time that they're near to him is maybe at night when they need protection. Well, they're not getting familiar with his voice. They're not drawing close to him because they don't know what his call sounds like. And in those dangerous times when there's so many things and so many commotions, we can be drawn astray. But his word says that if we know his voice, he says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. 
neither shall anyone snatch him out of my hand because we draw, we're, we're near to him in the secret place. We know his voice. And so this is, this is a fruit of being in his presence is knowing his voice, is knowing who he is. And in the secret place, we get to know the Father is near, but we get to know that, that he, he's protecting us, that he, he's provided for us, that he will give us eternal life, that we shall not perish in his hands. And we, we can't just know that by, by just coming to church on Sunday and expecting that we can know his grand power when he is the God over everything. He's the God over our Mondays, our Tuesdays, our Wednesdays. He's the, the God over every moment of every day. He is so wonderful and powerful, but we can't know that if we like, like Dave preached one time, um, if we put him in a box in our mind, we, we can't comprehend his greatness. But abiding in the secret place, like Psalm 91 says, we realize his power. We realize how great and wonderful he is. And then when these things come against us, we do not fear because we know his voice. We know that he's our shepherd. We know that he's a good shepherd and that we will not perish in his hands. And so... Lord was really speaking to me why the secret place because can we not isn't it good to pray together it is yes it's great we should be we should come together and pray together it's there's unity in the body and God wants us to be in the body because together we represent him better we represent him fully but like Joanna was saying he has a desire and a calling and a gift and gifts for every single one of us and he desires for us to seek him first and then, out of an overflow, it affects the body. So I want to read in Jeremiah 17, verse 7. Um, let's see. I have to pull it up here. So it's Jeremiah 17 and verse 7. So this verse says, Blessed is the man whose trust in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the water which spreads out its roots by the river. And you shall not fear when heat comes, but its leaves shall be green. And it will not be anxious in the, in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and, dis, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to, to the fruit of his doings. So I read this and it says, blessed is the man whose God is the Lord, who plants himself by the living water. So if, if Jesus is the living water, you know how he said, he said to the woman at the well, he said, I am the living, you know, this is the living water. This water I give you, you shall never thirst again. When we plant ourselves by that, and we realize that we plant ourselves by who? It's Jesus. Because he says that, this living water I give you, this is my gospel. You will never thirst again because what I give you, no one else can give you. No well can give you. No, no earthly waterways can give it, give it to you. But this well that, that I've given you, this is living water. And so when we plant ourselves by living water, well, it's really we're planting ourselves next to Jesus. We're planting ourselves next to his word. We're planting ourselves next to who he is, that it doesn't change. It's living water. It gives us life. And so when he says, you'll be like a tree planted by the, the water. But it says that it, it will spread out its roots by the river and shall not fear when heat comes. You know, when we spend time in the secret place, the beauty and, and amazing thing about it is that it's, an, it's, an, it's a discipline. It's, it's a decision that we make even when we don't want to. But see, what that does is when we plant ourselves by the water every day, we, we take the time to spend time in the secret place. We, we give him our attention day after day. We're like a tree who plants himself by the water, and the roots start growing. See, the roots start growing into the living water so that they're beneath the surface. No one sees. That's the secret place. The roots that draw beneath the surface. You see, seeing if we're really spending time in the secret place, where it should really show first is that like it says, when a drought or heat comes, you, you will not be anxious. Because when situations change, you realize, I've been doing this. I've been spending time close to my Father. I know who He is. He doesn't change. I didn't, it doesn't matter what time or what situations I've gone through in my life. I've been planted by Him. 
And so when heat comes, and you know, if you think about plants, when heat comes, that's when withering comes, that's when fruit can be withheld. But if we're planted by living water, or our roots are grown deep into the water, then when the drought comes, when, when waves of heat come in the world, this thing that we've built in the secret place that's beneath the surface, you, re- you realize no one sees that. No one sees that. People see this, this tree, you know, that we are, that this plant that we've been growing, but people don't see the, the, the roots that you've grown in, in, in the secret place. But you see the value in that is that you're not one day good, and then when a heat comes, you're, you're, you're just away with the, the drought. You're easily blown over by the wind. But because your roots have been grown in him, then the seasons don't affect your, your, your faithfulness to Jesus. And so, I think it's, it's, it's amazing what it says in Jeremiah, when you, if you keep reading, it says that you will not fear the heat, but the leaf will be green, and you will not be anxious in drought, in, in drought nor will you cease from yielding fruit. Because we're planted by living water that doesn't change. The living water that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't stop bringing life. He's the living water, and he will never turn to deathly water. He's always living water. It will constantly produce living water. So we will never stop yielding fruit out of a life. How many times do we see people around us and Christians that you can tell when they've not grown, drawn close to the Lord in the secret place because as soon as things get hard, they stop looking like a Christian. They stop showing love. They stop showing faithfulness to one another. They stop showing a, a humbled heart and they start becoming selfish. They start becoming, you know, self-serving. It's because when we're rooted in him, then it's, we're not easily shifted by the wind. But it's being planted into him, we will constantly produce the fruit of the Spirit. So I'll, I'll try to wrap it up here. Um, I just have one more thing that the Lord was speaking to me, and it goes off of what I was just saying, because we were created as vessels of the Lord. And we were created to house, to be filled with his presence. And in the garden, we were filled with him. He even gave us, we were made in his image, and he even gave us dominion like he had dominion, but he gave us dominion over the creation. So we were made as vessels, but when we then left the garden, we were now vessels emptied of his presence. And so we are filled with whatever we are around. And we, we know that there's the fruits of the flesh. There's things of the flesh that we see, and, and these, these things are selfishness, and they're, they're, they're evils, and they, they, they look like, they look like the to- total, complete opposite of who Jesus is. But there's also the fruits of the Spirit. And you see, we can house either of those, but it's what we're around and what we're being filled by. So if we are vessels, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, don't you know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? We have been made temples of the Holy Spirit. When we were renewed by Christ, you think about the image of Jesus flipping the tables in the temple. He came into our lives and he flipped over the tables of distraction. He flipped over the tables of, of worthless things that were in us so that we could be a clean temple so that his spirit could come and fill us. And so if we are vessels, then spending time in the secret place is like it's like a faucet of living waters filling us. And to see what happens in the secret places as that fills up because we, we're spending time with him is because we're spending time in his word and we're understanding who he is. We're filled with it. We're filled with whatever we're by. And then it starts overflowing into those around us. That's when the secret place, like Joanna was talking about her dream, you're diving into the presence of the living water. You're filled by it. And it's then when he sends you out. You know, God's not gonna send you out dumping out if you're in lack that's, that's, that's the point when if you're in lack, if you're in need, you need to draw close to him in the secret place. You need to shut the door. You need to get intimate with him. But it's when you're filled and you're overflowing that he sends you out to go and fill people with this living water. And we were meant to represent Jesus. And I was thinking about when, when I, I used to have a mindset of, of I would go to, to places and school and and. And you see people who are just living worldly. You know, they're living completely opposite to what you've been taught and what, what you know is good and pure and righteous. And you go, Lord, I, pray, I, I just pray that you would encounter them. 
Like just, just completely encounter them and, and just change their mindset, Lord. Just encounter them. I want you to encounter them. But then you realize, well, Jesus left and he says, if I leave, I'll send you the helper. We would then become temples of the Holy Spirit to represent Jesus. So if we're praying for, for God to encounter people, but we're not willing to step out and actually show them Jesus, then we're missing the point of what he's made us to be. Because if we were made to be temples of the Holy Spirit, we were meant to represent who Jesus is on this earth. When he left, he then called us individually to be a house of his spirit. This is the reason that he didn't slice up the Holy Spirit and say, here, I give you a measure of the Holy Spirit. But the wholeness of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And because it lives in us, we can represent Christ to people. And so if we want people to be encountered by his presence, well, we need to walk in an overflow that it's whatever we're doing. If we're in the supermarket and we're talking to a cashier, it's just by how we're living. It's by how we're loving. He says that you'll, they will know you are my disciple by your love for one another. It's out of the overflow of your heart. It's out of the overflow of who Jesus is. And he's filled you with, you, with his presence in the secret place. It's that overflow that people then can encounter Jesus through you. And I say a true overflow of Jesus in you and his, through his spirit. It, it, it gives glory only to him and not to you. That is true overflow. Because if we understand what the glory goes to is not in us. So for Ephesians 2.18 says it's, it's, we're saved by grace through faith, not works lest we should boast. So it's not out of my good doings. It's not, it's not even, I can't even brag, I've spent more time in the secret place than you. That's why I represent Jesus better. It's not out of my works. Because secret place is really just you turning your attention to who he is. It's not you being a better Christian. And, and, and Zechariah 4, 6 says, it's, it's not by power or might, but it's by your spirit. It's by the power of his Holy Spirit that I speak on his behalf. It is by the wisdom that comes from above that speaks through me. But it's, it's, it's not my own works. So when we overflow, true overflow should not look like glory to, to me. When we're living out of overflow for, of, of our faith in, in Jesus, people should meet us and see Jesus. People should encounter how we live and walk, and we should look set apart because it's not us who's shining through, it's Jesus who's shining through. And the last thing I want to say is in, um, it's in 2 Timothy, and it's chapter 2, um, verse 20. So if you want to turn there with me. That... Okay, so 2 Timothy 2.20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also from youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who have called me the Lord out of a pure heart. And so he says, but also avoid foolishness and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife, and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility and correction. So he verse says, we, in, a, in a good house, because this is the house of the Lord, there's vessels, and there's different, there's different vessels, right? There's, there's some that are made out of gold and silver. They look shiny to other people. They look, they look of value, right? But there's some that are of, of wood and clay, some of honor and some of dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of the latter. I, th I think the important thing of that, he doesn't say there's some of gold and clay. The, gold and cl or there's the, the, the gold ones are of honor and the clay is of dishonor. No, there's many different types of vessels in the house of the Lord. So some of us are going to look shiny and, and vibrant to other people. Maybe that's how we represent Christ. But some of us are clay. We're humbled in, humbled in appearance. But we are cleansed, cleansed for the, the requirement to be a useful vessel, in, according to this verse, is not that we're gold or we're silver, but it's that we're cleansed of all wickedness. So when we are spending time in the secret place, it says that, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, for every good work. When we spend time in the secret place, we're allowing Jesus to wash us. 
He's created us a vessel. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're gold, silver, clay, wood. He cleanses you in the secret place so that you will be used for good works. He cleanses you so that you can be filled because he's not going to fill a dirty cup. He's not going to because he wants the overflow to be only him. So he cleans us first before we overflow. And so what this says is, is every single one of us, it doesn't matter what you look like, are vessels of the Holy Spirit and he will fill us if we allow him to clean us. So this is what I close with. It's just that, you, that, that we remember that this is what, what we are. We are, we are vessels of, of him, meant to be filled by his presence, meant to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And he can use every single one of us. But he, he desires personal relationship with us because it's in that personal relationship that time set aside for him and only him that he cleans us. The intimate time with the Lord, the, the time where no other thing is distracting us. And so the last, the, this, this is actually the, the last thing I was going to, so some practical tips and many of you guys, I'm sure many of you guys already have this discipline in, in your life, but there's just things that I've learned to enter into the secret place with the Lord. Um, and it's just finding a place Find a place where you are not distracted. Find a place where you can see the greatness of the Lord. And for me, that's out, out the outdoors. I, I find a lot of quietness and peace out there, but I also look at all the things around me and I see his greatness. But for some people, it might look different. Like Joanna said, it might be your car. You might encounter him in your car. It might be a closet. It might be a room in your house. Um, just a place where you're not distracted. And you put away all distractions and something we told to the youth, and it might not be the same for everyone here, but my phone can be a big distraction. So I put away my phone. And, and then I say that the next thing is to quiet your mind and your heart before the Lord. Quiet your mind and your heart because if you come into the secret place and you want to hear his voice, and we're coming with a busy mind of what, everything we've done for the day and everything we want to see him do and encounter in our life, we're coming with a, a full mind and not ready to receive because if prayer is a two-way street and we're just ready to unload to him we're not it's not tr true communication with him and and for me the quieting of my mind and my heart comes through reading of his word and worship and i was telling people um it, it, the kids are our youth you know that doesn't make an excuse oh i need my phone so that i can play worship music no 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 because worship is truly a heart posture and quieting our mind comes from putting our heart and our mind on him and so for that, worship can just be reading. Sometimes I just read a psalm and I'm just giving praise to the Lord for his greatness and his goodness. And that changes my mindset from coming fully loaded of everything that I've done for the day and the week and a busy mind. And I focus my mind on him and how his greatness is. And worship can look like just, just singing a song or just saying, Lord, how great you are. Like just giving him the glory, giving him the honor. And then the next thing I would say, if you're going to encounter him in the secret place, come with thanksgiving. The word says, says to, in, in Psalm 100, it says approach, to, we, we should approach in thanksgiving. In Psalm 100, it says, let me read that real quick. It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord all, with all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come to his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not ourselves. We are his people, the sheep in his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and the truth endures to all generations. So when we enter into his presence, come with a thankful heart. Because if we come so busy and focused on ourselves, we can totally miss what he's wanting to speak to us. So I say, for me, the, the thing that I've learned a lot, and maybe a lot of you guys have understood the similar thing, is that when you come to the Lord with a heart of thanksgiving, the focus comes off of, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I need. And we say, Lord, you've been faithful. We focus on, Lord, you've been faithful. Even if I'm just thankful that you've given me breath right now, that you've given me a place and a space to pray to you, that you've given me the ability to, to just have your word with me, um, then give, approaching the gates with thanksgiving is so important because we realize that he is God and what Psalm 100 says, he is God and we are not. You know, he created us and we did not. So we approach him with, with a, f a fear of the Lord saying, God, you're so great. We thank you for it. 
And the last thing is, which I said, is make it a discipline and a priority to spend time in His presence because if we only do it when we want to, then those roots won't grow very deep. Because also, I, I, like Joanna was saying, is we need to serve Him for the sake of today. We don't, we don't go, well, maybe I'll have time tomorrow because tomorrow's not promised, but today is. He's given us today, so we praise Him for today, and we make it a discipline because even when we don't feel like it, He's still God. Even when we don't see it, He's still faithful, and He's still good, and He's still the creator of the universe. Even when we feel like He's in a small box, He's not. And His word and His, and his glory shows that. And when we draw close to Him, even in those moments, we realize He's He's always the same. He's always loving us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. So I just want to end in a prayer um, for, for every one of us. Um, so Lord Jesus, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you that you desire relationship with us. Lord, I thank you that you, you desire us to hear your voice and to know you so well that we could discern your voice above any other voice in this earth. Lord, I thank you that you are speaking to our hearts in, in, in hundreds of different ways because you want us to connect with you on a way that only, only you can connect with us, Lord. I thank you because you're God and we're not. And you know what we need before we should even ask. But Lord, you desire for us to approach you with those needs because you desire for us to come to you first, to seek you first. Lord, I thank you for bringing us here in this house tonight. Lord, I thank you for every single person who has spent their time to come into your presence. Thank you for what you have spoke both through me and Joanna and what you will continue to speak into our hearts about spending intimate time with you. Lord, I thank you because you are faithful and you are always near to us. Your word is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And let us understand that more and more, that you are continually faithful and it doesn't matter what the situations and what life looks like surrounding us. The earth and this world will, will shake and it will go through seasons, but you are faithful through it all. Let us be trees planted by the water, roots grown deep, producing fruits of godliness to the world that will never change depending on the season. We will represent you in fullness to those around us. And we praise your holy, holy name, Jesus.